We can start with the policy panel. So the title of this uh, policy panel is uh, Liquidity and Monetary Policy, and uh, I'm reminded of a, of a story uh, several years ago, many years ago, when uh, a young assistant professor whose name uh, at the time was uh, Greg Mankiw, I think, was presenting in front of Thomas Sargent, and uh, he had a working paper with the title Money Matters. And uh, Tom Sargent interrupted him after 30 seconds and said, you have two terms there that you need to define. And uh, Mankiw immediately uh, responded, okay, I meant monetary policy matters. And then Sargent said, now you have three terms. <laughs> so we have now liquidity and monetary policy. And uh, even to begin to define the terms is, uh, is very difficult. I would think that uh, I'm not going to try to define monetary policy as it seems to be changing every day uh, in the current crisis, but at least a safe starting definition for liquidity would be you know, the availability of reserves to commercial banks and also to uh, including access to, uh, to further reserves. Uh, but how this uh, interacts with the various new forms of monetary policy that we have experienced is something uh, that is to be explored uh, also today. Now, um, there are many new questions uh, that come to mind uh, when thinking about uh, this topic, uh, and I'm sure I can only think of a small subset of them, uh, and we'll see how many of those or how many more uh, the um, uh, today's participants, uh, today's panelists, distinguished panelists, uh, address. Uh, so here are a couple that come to my mind at least. Uh, one is, uh, was already mentioned by Raghura Jan, uh, in a world of, a, of very low uh, nominal interest rates, uh, barely above the, the commonly perceived lower bounded zero, how will uh, banks and the financial sector more broadly uh, respond to such low levels of interest rates, and in particular uh, in the context of, uh, of risk taking. Uh, Second question, does provision of liquidity uh, to banks interfere with market forces that would push insolvent banks out of the picture? Third question, when we're talking about liquidity, an important source of liquidity for banks is, uh, of course, deposits, customer deposits. How have recent developments influenced the uh, potential access to deposits uh, for commercial banks in the future. So, for example, the developments uh, in Cyprus, the um, uh, private sector involvement there that uh, confiscated part of the capital of big depositors, but also gave, uh, ra raised suspicions uh, to insure depositors that uh, maybe their deposits uh, could come under question in the future. Um, does a commitment to provide liquidity to solvent banks extend to a commitment to provide liquidity uh, to fiscal authorities, to, uh, to governments? Um, now, moving to the ECB, to a central bank that has uh, to address many fiscal authorities, to a first approximation suggests that we have more independence. We uh, break this one-to-one -one relationship between a government and a central bank, whereby the government could dictate to the central bank uh, what it wants. Uh, but uh, how about when you have many different uh, governments uh, who are not coordinated and uh, who disagree between them as to uh, what should happen uh, on the fiscal front and uh, what should happen on, on the growth front? Uh, so, uh, with whom does the uh, central bank correspond, interact, and uh, coordinate? Um, and uh, finally, if I may uh, so add, um, what are the implications of introducing a new actor to um, monetary policy, which is uh, the courts? 
so you have non-specialist uh, courts, non-economists, actually uh, discussing and uh, reaching conclusions that could influence or constrain monetary policy. So these are only a subset of questions that could come to mind uh, in uh, looking at today's topic, but I cannot think of a better panel to discuss uh, some of these maybe, but also uh, many others uh, regarding liquidity and monetary policy than what we have today. So in alphabetical order as they uh, sit uh, next to me, uh, Vito Constancio is going to be the first speaker. He has been Vice President of the ECB since June 2010 after having served two terms as Governor of uh, the Banco de Portugal. Otmar Ising is the President of CFS since 2006. He was previously member of the Executive Board of the ECB, responsible for the Directorate General for Economics and for Research, and has served on the board of the Bundesbank prior to this. And finally, uh, Jeremy Stein is a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He was previously the Safra Professor of Economics at Harvard University and a senior advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury in the Obama administration. But uh, so the format is uh, each of the panelists is going to give a 15-minute presentation and then uh, we will open the floor to questions uh, from the public and to discussion. So first, uh, Governor Costanzi. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to uh, be able to uh, participate in uh, this event at the time of the attribution of the Deutsche Bank Prize uh, for a financial economist to Wagur and Rajan. Uh, I became a greater admirer of uh, Ragu uh, and Ragu's work, um, even if not a totally uncritical one, <laughs> Uh, after his premonitory 2005 paper presented at Jackson Hole, um, it was a paper I distributed widely to colleagues and friends uh, because I thought that it was really quite, uh, um, uh, quite premonitory of what could happen. But of course, uh, uh, Raguran's uh, previous work um, many of it with Douglas Diamond, was uh, quite uh, well known, addressing uh, problems of theory of banking, of bank's capital, of liquidity risk, liquidity creation, uh, and financial fragility. All of that were uh, papers that were important uh, for all central bankers to really understand the role and the risks associated with the working of banking systems. Well, we are talking about liquidity and monetary policy, and liquidity is a somewhat elusive uh, concept. There are, in fact, many definitions, many perspectives uh, uh, in looking to uh, liquidity, uh, even if uh, we all can admit that we can start from the definition which Keynes provided in the uh, treaties uh, in 1930, uh, which is uh, Liquidity is a matter of degree and comparison, and he defined that uh, an asset is more liquid than another if it can be realized at short notice without loss. Uh, but that's just a broad uh, concept. And uh, this notion of liquidity is also elusive because, as we know, in a perfect uh, general equilibrium uh, uh, analysis with uh, complete uh, calculable contingent claims and arrow, arrow uh, uh, contracts, liquidity does not arise. Uh, I understand that uh, Luigi presented a model where uh, he had to introduce a distortion for liquidity to appear. That's also true in what regards the traditional portfolio uh, analysis. Um, and there are, of course, many ways of introducing the need for liquidity and liquidity demand. Uh, Ragu and Diamond uh, do that in their papers by assuming that assets are illiquid, uh, as they say, because they cannot be sold or borrowed against for the full value they generate. 
That's one way of introducing liquidity. Another way, uh, which is similar, uh, is the one used by Jean Tirol and uh, uh, Bengt Ostrom, where they just assume that uh, the whole e future income of households and part of the income of firms cannot be pledged uh, for the future. And if that happens, then both uh, households and producers have to consider financial shocks uh, and have to increase, reinforce their liquidity positions in order to be able to uh, implement their consumption and uh, production uh, plans. And uh, they go uh, then in defining and distinguish between inside liquidity, which is the one that the system can create against pledgeable future cash flow, and outside liquidity, which is then created by the state in general terms, uh, out of its uh, power to tax uh, uh, people uh, and people's future income. Uh, this distinction is uh, useful uh, to be aware uh, because, of course, uh, um, well, outside liquidity is created mostly by the central banks, but not only. The budget directly can do it through occasional bailouts, through deposit guarantee schemes, through some type of uh, uh, social security programs and so on. And outside liquidity can also come from uh, uh, cross-border uh, lending. So inside liquidity can be excessive, as it was uh, before the crisis, as a result of the expansion of a shadow banking sector and the increase in activity of secured lending and repos with uh, uh, repeated re of the securities. Um, and in that situation, as uh, Songshin and uh, uh, Tobias uh, Adrian have shown, that uh, uh, puts into question the relevance of monetary and credit aggregates to represent the overall liquidity uh, uh, situation. More is needed to be considered. And uh, inside liquidity can also be insufficient, um, of course, as it occurs after a crisis when the chain of inside liquidity creation collapsed, markets froze, fire sales reduced asset values, and recession expectations affected estimates of future income. And that is when, of course, uh, the public intervention is necessary to restore a more normal situation of liquidity necessary to sustain economic activity. But there are many more distinctions and perspectives when we talk about, uh, um, about liquidity, and one has to be aware of that in order to uh, understand each other and the way people are using the concept. Um, this, uh, cons this distinction of inside and outside liquidity partly overlaps, but not totally, the distinction between private and official liquidity. And we can also talk, and uh, we talk, about macroeconomic liquidity, which is connected with the broad uh, uh, monetary and financial conditions uh, measured against some uh, notion of what would be the liquidity appropriate to have non-inflationary growth uh, in the economy. We can talk and talk about market liquidity, which is different, and balance sheet liquidity and funding liquidity. And uh, we have, of course, uh, relations between all of that, as uh, Bruno Meyer and Pedersen have shown uh, in the crisis by uh, talking about liquidity spirals that result when market liquidity and uh, funding liquidity uh, interact uh, in a significant way and create then uh, first liquidity spirals upwards and then downwards. Well, so we have to consider all this, and precisely it was the first point that uh, uh, was uh, uh, addressed by how uh, um, a chair, um, we see that we have to consider many uh, perspectives on liquidity. How can we assess the, the, the general liquidity situation in Europe and the US uh, right now? Uh, well, those who tend to focus only on the central bank balance sheets and the monetary base uh, sometimes think that uh, the world is awash in, in liquidity which is something that uh, gold buffs uh, uh, like very much to underline. 
forgetting what has happened meanwhile to private liquidity or inside liquidity, banks are deleveraging uh, uh, and, uh, and, and shrinking, um, and many hedge agents are also deleveraging as a result of the over indebtedness. Um, well, and regarding price indicators like uh, interest rates of the general liquidity conditions, uh, it is true that uh, interest rates are very low for, for quite a while, which creates, of course, risks for asset markets. Um, but developments uh, in Europe in particular in output and employment and inflation in the market for goods and services uh, do not seem to indicate a situation of total excessive uh, liquidity. Credit and money multipliers have collapsed and we cannot uh, assess in isolation the evolution of the monetary base. ECB staff's projections put inflation for next year at 1.3%, uh, which is uh, below and not very close to 2%. Negative output gap and high unemployment indicate that the full employment uh, uh, equilibrium uh, real interest rate should be more negative, which is impossible to, to achieve as we approach the nominal zero bounds. And even if we assume and accept all the doubts that Ragu has raised about this uh, view, uh, about the effectiveness and even the possibility of reaching uh, very negative uh, interest rates, uh, and doubts are absolutely pertinent uh, about, uh, about that, no doubt. But even if uh, all that is true, that does not prove that the opposite policy would be better in uh, this uh, situation. That is another uh, um, debate or another uh, discussion. Uh, well, nevertheless, all this is true for the market of goods and services. What about the asset markets? As I said, low uh, interest rates create risks uh, in the uh, asset markets. And we have observed before the crisis uh, the disconnect between asset prices and inflation in the market of goods and services. In February this year, in the noted, uh, noted uh, speech, Jeremy raised the possibility uh, of this happening again as search for yields by financial institutions was beginning to affect prices and in some riskier asset classes like covenant light uh, loans, uh, rates, junk and high yield bonds, and so on in the US. I like in his analysis that he abandoned the textbook fiction that asset prices depend only on the behavior, uh, preferences, and beliefs of uh, final consumers as investors and introduces uh, an institutional driven analysis making prices dependent on the incentives framework of managers in searching for yield. That is exactly what Ragu did in his 2005 paper. Uh, it is indeed important to consider institutions' behavior. Think, for instance, about the structural trend of banks and dealers to reduce the, their inventories of bonds and how the consequent reduction of liquidity in the secondary market may affect volatility, overshooting and price spikes. Pointing to the responsibility of low interest rates, uh, nevertheless, uh, Jeremy asked cautiously, and I uh, quote, would one really want to raise rates and risk choking off economic activity? Wouldn't it be better to use a more narrowly focused supervisory or regulatory approach with less potential for damage to the economy? End of quote. Considering the limitations of macroprudential policies in dealing with asset price booms, he did not want to exclude forever the possibility of using monetary policy to help to do the job. I recognize that monetary policy cannot ignore financial stability considerations, and in situations of high credit growth that endanger the creation of asset price bubbles, I have endorsed the possibility of a leaning against the wind monetary policy. Excesses in credit, leverage, and asset prices always lead to crises and endanger medium-term price stability. But in any case, the situation right now is different in Europe. 
where none of the phenomenon described by Jeremy for the US in those uh, uh, asset classes really uh, uh, exists. I also think that uh, all the institutional changes after the crisis have enhanced the instruments of macroprudential policy and I am sure have also reinforced the disposition to really apply them. Macroprudential policies must now be tried in a serious way as a priority. We have to recognize that monetary policy cannot do everything. And uh, by the way, the fact that uh, uh, monetary policy and central banks uh, uh, have been seen as the only game in town, it's not the doing of central bankers, but it was first and foremost the doing of economic theory uh, that really put into question all other types of policies to stabilize the economies and uh, really created an environment and a theory and a vision where uh, only the monetary policy could do, could do something. But that is not true. It cannot do everything. Uh, well, in particular, the U.S. cannot uh, cater for price stability, low unemployment, uh, financial stability, economic growth, everything. Uh, it's really more and more difficult. I consider that in Europe, the ECB has been managing liquidity adequately to the pursuance of our goals, ensuring price stability on a medium-term basis, and when that is insured, catering for financial stability, output, and unemployment. In normal times, central banks nowadays manage their provision of primary liquidity with the view to achieve their target for a short-term monetary market rate, normally the overnight rate, but not always. Uh, the ECB, as other modern central banks, conducts monetary policy with mandatory remunerated reserves uh, of banks and a corridor around the policy rate defined by two standing facilities. This means that the signal of one particular policy rate can coexist with different levels of bank reserves on condition that the liquidity management operations ensure that the liquidity provided is not either excessive or insufficient in relation to the demand by profit-maximizing banks that react to the opportunity cost of reserves. What matters for managing liquidity is the targeted policy rate and whatever amount of liquidity is necessary to achieve it. In our case, we keep the banking sector in a liquidity deficit and supply liquidity normally via lending to the banks through a system of auctions. It should be noted that other central banks supply liquidity mostly through outright purchases of securities, like the Fed nowadays, normally short-term government paper. But both models of liquidity provision, as we know, were changed after the crisis. In the case of the US, longer maturities and some private paper started to be bought. In our case, since October 2008, we abandoned the system of auctions with variable rates and entered a mode of fixed rate full allotment of all liquidity demanded by the banks, provided that they have eligible collateral to pledge. Also, in December 2011 and February 2012, we launched extraordinary operations with three maturities that totaled 1 trillion euros, implying, however, a lower net increase of 500, million, 500 billion in our monetary base uh, as uh, the banks reduce their use of shorter maturities. Our particular method of supplying primary liquidity makes the future absorption of liquidity in excess of the minimum reserve requirements easy to achieve. Banks have to repay what they have borrowed when maturity is reached. In reality, as their situation has improved, they have been anticipating the repayment of the two LTROs. They have repaid uh, 360 billion, or 64% of the net increase of the 500 billion, and the excess liquidity that attained a peak of 813 billion in March 2012 is now reduced, reduced to 218 billion. We are exiting, smoothing, in a smooth way from the extraordinary uh, measures took at a certain point. In the present mode of conducting monetary policy, the overnight market rate 
is determined by the excess liquidity and the size of the corridor between the policy rate and the deposit facility rate. This makes it more difficult to influence its level and the correspondent influence on other short-term money market rates. For instance, as the excess liquidity keeps declining, commanded by the banks, not by us, there may be pressure on short, rate, on short rates to increase. At the same time, contagion from the US after the announcement of tapering of outright purchases resulted in higher rates in Europe. So we decided to introduce an important change in our policy, announcing a form of forward guidance by stating that we will keep our key rates stable or lower for an extended period of time, dependent on our assessment of medium-term prospects for inflation. It should be noted that although compatible with our monetary policy framework, this represents a real innovation in our instruments. It is conditional, as a negative bias, and this forward guidance will change only when we change our assessment of the impact of economic and monetary conditions on medium-term inflation prospects. The new policy produced visible results as the whole forward curve of euro rates up to two years came immediately down after our announcement, and although it has meanwhile increased a bit, it remains stabilized below uh, where, where it was before the announcement. For the future, we are, as usual, data dependent, but we may face problems that would have to be addressed if the de declining excess liquidity would put undue upward pressure on short-term rates. We still have several policy instruments available in our toolbox, and we'll use them as needed. We will continue to manage liquidity conditions so as to maintain a stable monetary and economic environment that ensures our main goal of medium-term inflation below but close to two. Thank you for your attention. So, Otmar Singh is next. This Deutsche Bank price in financial economics, on the one hand, causes a lot of work for the Center for Financial Studies, especially for my colleagues. Uh, on the other hand, already the feedback on the invitation to make proposals uh, for the price gives a fascinating overview how researchers really worldwide see progress uh, in this field of uh, finance and monetary economics. And finally, uh, the conference, uh, as always this time too, brings together an outstanding group of uh, researchers. In my short presentation on <clears throat> liquidity and monetary policy, I will concentrate on this uh, interaction between liquidity and monetary policy. Uh, we have a strong overlap, Vitor, uh, without having seen our papers. Uh, you will see it immediately from my first sentence. Uh, I will read it. Liquidity is a highly relevant quality in any economy, and yet, at the same time, it is one of the most elusive concepts. <laughs> the term is used to characterize the situation of economic agents or sectors, and the quality of an asset or group of assets. The Radcliffe report, I think nobody today uh, who is not of my age has any memory of that. It was published in 1959. It was very prominent at that time. Uh, it was an influential publication. Put overall liquidity in the center for the assessment of the situation of an economy. However, it turned out that this concept was not operational. There existed neither a feasible approach for measurement, nor could the central bank in any way control this complex variable. For an extended period of time, a number of central banks used proxies of liquidity in the banking sector as their foremost analytical tool, as well 
as their intermediate target for the conduct of monetary policy. The Fed, for example, used free reserves uh, for this purpose. Before adopting monetary, policy, monetary targeting in 1975, the Bundesbank <coughs> was, strategy was dominated by the concept of uh, free liquidity reserve, the Freien Liquiditätsreserve. Free liquid reserves were basically defined as the sum of excess reserves, reserves at the central bank minus minimum reserves plus the available refinancing potential at the central bank. Uh, I will come back to this uh, uh, very soon. This concept became more and more dubious because on the one hand it was almost impossible to measure free liquid reserves appropriately and on the other hand free liquid reserves lacked the prerequisites needed uh, for an intermediate target. So it was no surprise that central banks followed other approaches, from monetary targeting to inflation targeting to the two-pillar strategy of the ECB, etc., etc. Liquidity is not any more used as a properly defined concept. However, bankers, central bankers included worldwide, use the term liquidity probably every day. In its last annual report, the BIS sees the need for central banks, I quote, to balance various considerations, including the availability of high quality collateral, regulatory reforms and views concerning the appropriate role of central banks liquidity in normal and turbulent times. Well, it brings together the concept of liquidity with all the other issues, regulation, uh, etc. And uh, President Draghi, during the press conference on the 1st of August this year, said, I quote, and I will restate that liquidity will remain ample as long as it is needed. Nobody would doubt that liquidity is ample, but how ample is liquidity? <clears throat> the rich statistical part, for example, of the ECB's monthly bulletin has no table on liquidity. And this does not come as a surprise. The liquidity position of the banking sector is influenced not only by its reserves at the central bank. Potential access to refinancing at the central bank is a close substitute to central bank money. In case of a policy of full allotment at a fixed rate, the stock of eligible collateral corrected for haircuts has the characteristic of near central bank money. And any change in the collateral policy has an influence on the liquidity of the banking sector as a whole, as well as of individual banks. The liquidity situation of individual banks depends also crucially on the functioning or malfunctioning of the money market. Finally, Changes in the overall economic situation will also have an influence on the liquidity of banks and the banking system as a whole. A collapse, for example, of the housing market is a case when the market for mortgages becomes illiquid. The interaction of agents in markets can also create and destroy liquidity, uh, for example, via financial innovations. The contrast of a worldwide expansion of central banks' balance sheets and the corresponding increase in central bank money on the one hand and the slow pace of growth of broad money on the other hand demonstrates that higher liquidity does not necessarily translate into stronger demand. As Keynes, back in 1933, famously once has remarked, we cannot make the horses drink but we can provide them with water. It was in the means to prosperity. Impulses from monetary policy work through the banking system. This is especially true for a financial system like that of the euro area, which is dominated by bank lending. The ECB can reduce its interest rates and improve the liquidity situation of the banking system, but 
The central bank cannot force banks to expand lending to business. Any attempt to make central bank refinancing conditional on lending has its limits, as the Bank of England's funding for lending scheme has demonstrated. And, as Raghu Rajan in his famous Jackson Hole contribution stressed, liquidity infusion is not costless. I quote, it does impose lower policy rates, sometimes for a considerable duration, and entails a tax on savers and transfer to those who need the liquidity. Uh, what does it mean that he made this remark before the outbreak of the last crisis? This cost, uh, Rajan mentioned, becomes especially visible in an extended period of time of very low interest rates via the so-called risk-taking channel. Theory would predict that ample liquidity and low interest rates come together. This raises the question to what extent quantitative easing and interest rate policy could be treated as different instruments. Ample liquidity provided at very low interest rates causes a combination which creates strong incentives for risky investments. There are many studies done by the ECB. Uh, Lukas Papademos uh, published together with Jürgen Stark a volume with many contributions uh, which uh, present research on this connection. Central banks dispose of no measures to prevent that ample liquidity is not used for business investment, but for investing in financial assets. There was in the past the illusion, very popular at the Bundesbank, that via rediscounting, you can, do, so to say, earmark liquidity, central bank money by, uh, provided by the central bank for investing in the real sector. But we know this is an illusion. Uh, bills might be discounted, but uh, what the money is used for finally uh, it's not in the control of the central bank. And I think uh, this idea, uh, which was rejected by Thornton, by the way, already in the middle of the 19th century, uh, is not uh, represented anymore. I, I hope so. Um, the risk of bubbles, uh, which is implied in this no controllability by the central bank of the use of central bank money, uh, probably also in the construction sector, is the other side of the cost of liquidity infusion. Another aspect of such a situation is the impact on individual banks. Intended or not, ample liquidity at very low interest rates will help banks to survive, which under normal, also those banks which under normal conditions would become insolvent. So, Betchot's uh, definition uh, of lender of last resort becomes doubtful because uh, this distinguishing between illiquidity and insolvency is, in many cases, almost, it, it's very difficult. Let's leave it to that. <clears throat> Those banks, which under normal conditions would become insolvent, have strong incentives to undertake risky investments uh, if it's like giving uh, money to a person who is bankrupt, uh, a limited amount, it would be absolutely rational to use this money to go to the casino uh, and take uh, this risky action uh, in case, uh, just in the hope to get out of the uh, uncomfortable situation. Those banks, uh, as I said, have strong incentives to undertake risky investments and or continuing their lending to companies which might otherwise not be able to deliver on the debt service. Just continuing your credit to put new money where the old money was already uh, more or less uh, destroyed. In short, this is a situation in which zombie banks keep zombie companies alive. This is the opposite of what Betchard's rule would imply, namely providing unlimited credit to illiquid but solvent banks at a penalty rate. A central bank which conducts a policy of ample liquidity at extremely low interest rates in order to stimulate the economy has 
the corresponding risk of undermining a needed restructuring of the banking sector. Liquidity, as we all know, is no viable substitute for equity. I come to the conclusion, although liquidity is a vague concept, it has become the focus of monetary policy. One might also, and I'm not criticizing that, one might also be tempted to say vagueness is the very reason for its popularity. Quite often, the term is just used as a substitute for money. For the con uh, and Vito uh, Constantio rightly uh, has said that this is wrong. Uh, for the conduct of monetary policy, an adequate measurement of liquidity and an assessment how liquidity can be influenced and what the consequences will be are some of the greatest challenges for central banks. For a proper assessment, the central banks cannot ignore the interdependence of its own actions and global developments. Domestic and global liquidity ultimately will have an influence on domestic price stability, financial stability, and the real sector. And now I quote from the monthly bulletin of the ECB of summer last year, August last year. Given the multidimensional nature of global liquidity and the lack of a catch-all indicator to capture its development, it is important that a broad range of measures are monitored with a view to maximizing the information available to policymakers. To identify the problem is the first step and not a minor one. Uh, to deliver on this commitment is a tremendous challenge for which we all wish the ECB uh, full success. Jeremy Stein is next. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me let me start by thanking the organizers for including me uh, in, in in this event. You know, you know, you always say at the beginning of these things, "I'm happy to be here." I'm I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's really a, a sort of a great personal pleasure for me to be here with a, with old friends, with colleagues, to to pay tribute to to Regu. So so uh, I'm delighted to be included. Um, what I thought I would do is talk briefly about some, some recent research of mine, which is done jointly with Sam Hansen of, of Harvard Business School on the monetary transmission mechanism. And as, as will become clear in a couple of minutes, this work is pretty heavily influenced by, uh, by some of Ragu's earlier work, and in particular his famous Jackson Hole paper, to which everybody keeps, uh, keeps alluding. So I'll briefly describe what we find, and then I'll try and draw some connections to the current monetary policy situation, as well as some lessons about the interplay of uh, of monetary policy and financial stability. All right, so let me just start you out with a simple fact. Here's, here's basically what we find is that changes, and this is in normal times, this is pre-crisis, changes in the stance of monetary policy have surprisingly strong effects on real interest rates, that is to say interest rates on tips, very far out. So as a very concrete thing, uh, take a sample from 1999 onwards, a 100 basis point increase in the two-year T-bill rate on the day of an FOMC announcement, which you can think about as a proxy for the change in the, in the path of the short rate, 100 basis points on the nominal two-year goes along with a 42 basis point increase in the 10-year forward real rate, the 10-year forward overnight real rate extracted from the TIPS curve. So basically monetary policy seems, you know, obviously we do a bunch of stuff to make sure this is robust. Monetary policy seems to have a very powerful effect uh, not only on real rates, but on real rates 10, 20 years out on the, on the forward, uh, on the forward uh, curve. Now, just point out that this is completely at odds with the standard kind of macro models in which a central bank's ability to influence uh, real variables stems from goods prices, which are sticky in, uh, in nominal terms. In models like this, you can only have real effects of monetary policy over horizon, such th over horizon no longer than wi that which over prices can, uh, can adjust. And it's kind of hard to, to talk yourself into believing that you know, menu costs or whatever they are are such that prices can't adjust for 10 years. 
Okay, so there's really just a, a, a puzzle. Now, on the other hand, maybe the good news is this implies that monetary policy may have more kick or more potency than the standard model suggests, precisely because long-term real rates ought to be what, what matters for long-term investment. So, so um, you know, you may get traction on, on, on investment decisions. So what's going on? So how do, you, how do you sort of make sense of what, again, I think is an anomalous fact relative to the, to the standard model? Now, a first clue is that these movement in real rates appear to be changes in term premia rather than changes in the expected future path. That is to say, it does not appear that when monetary policy moves today, people change their expectation about what the nominal real rate will be 10 years from now. It's a term premium effect. That is to say, when monetary policy gets looser today, the price of 10-year bonds goes up, but it's in some sense because those bonds have gotten more expensive or will be a less good investment relative to, the, uh, relative to the path of short rates. So it's a term premium effect, and interestingly, it's a relatively short-lived one. It seems to revert on the order of something like 12 months. So in other words, easy policy today pushes down long rates, pushes up the price of, 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 of 10, 20-year tips, but that, that price effect tends to revert uh, over an intermediate horizon. Okay, so that's, that's the fact, that's the data. I think that part is, is reasonably um, clear. Now, of course, this raises the question of, of why. Why would monetary policy today have such a powerful effect on term premia uh, 10, 20 years down the road? So here's where we uh, are very much inspired by, by Raghu's work, and in particular his, his hypothesis that low nominal rates can create incentives for certain types of investors to reach to reach for yield. Now, as, as a number of people have noted today, there's now an emerging body of empirical work that looks at this idea. Much of this work has focused on the reach for yield mechanism in credit space. That is to say, do banks take more risk? Are credit spreads um, compressed? Our, our difference is we're going to look at the pricing of pure interest rate risk. So we're looking at treasury securities, no credit risk. We're just looking, in some sense, the reward for taking on duration, uh, duration risk. So the story we have in mind is imagine a set of yield-oriented investors, and all they do is choose between short and long-term treasury securities. Um, and in doing so, they put some weight not on just expected returns in the kind of classical economic sense, but on income on accounting income, on this period's accounting income. This preference for current income could be due to some sort of agency or accounting consideration. They care about their current earnings, banks' AFS portfolios, the way the accounting works. It's the income, it's the yield on the securities, not the mark-to-market -market, uh, 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 capital gains. And so when you have investors like that, if short rates go down, they're just not earning as much. I and mean, this is very much in the spirit of, of, of Ragu's uh, Jackson Hole story. They're just not earning as much at the short end. They have an induced demand to buy more at the long end so as to keep the overall yield of their uh, portfolio up, and that's the buying pressure that basically uh, moves, moves, moves term premium. So, you know, you might call this not an not a expectations channel, but a recruitment channel. That is to say, when the, when the Fed or when, when a central bank eases policy, it's effectively affecting the long end, not through its own direct action, but because it's recruiting other investors via an induced change in their risk appetite, it's recruiting other investors to do some of the lifting, uh, some of the lifting for it. So, you know, that's the theory. Uh, it's a theory. Um, we tried to get some evidence that bears on it. The best, the best thing we have is we were able to look at the maturity of securities held by commercial banks. Um, banks fit with this, dis this description of yield-oriented investors to the extent, as I said, that they care about their reported earnings, um, given some of their accounting rules, uh, which, 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 excuse me, which make current income uh, uh, um, depend on on current yield as opposed to mark-to-market uh, -market changes in value. And in fact, you find that when the yield curve steepens, when the yield curve steepens, banks do move out the, the average duration of the securities they hold, very much consistent with this story. Moreover, the magnitudes are such that when you aggregate across the banking sector, you know, it's plausible that this could, you know, could, could cause, uh, cause increases in, uh, uh, in term premium. And interestingly, we find that primary dealers who are on a mark-to-market -market basis, in some sense, take the other side of the trade. So interest rates go down, short rates go down, banks move to the long end, buy long-term treasuries, primary dealers seem to be accommodating this by, by reducing their, their holdings of long-term treasuries. So overall, my, my sort of take on the evidence, um, and this is, this is certainly uh, tentative and, and, and preliminary and all of that, is that ultimately some mechanism uh, 
you know, of the sort, depending on the kind of yield-oriented investors that Raghu has described, may ultimately turn out to be pretty central to the way we think about how monetary policy works. And when I say central, I mean, I don't think it's going to necessarily just be about credit risk or about banks taking credit risk. It's going to be, in some sense, about the broader set of risk premia uh, that affect not only uh, credit risky securities, but also uh, risk-free securities. Okay, now again, uh, this is, you know, this is sort of a start. A lot more would have to be done, but I think this could be an interesting line of work and, again, one that owes, uh, uh, owes a great deal to, to Regu's insights. Um, with, with these observations in mind, let me pivot a little bit and turn to uh, some of the events of the last few months in the bond market. So a very, very brief thumbnail summary is we had very low long-term real and nominal rates heading into the beginning of May. Just to remind you, in the U.S., the 10-year Treasury bottomed out about 1.63, uh, very negative term premium. The 10-year real rate was about minus 0.72, um, and then all that changed. So it changed on the heels first of uh, the Chairman's May 22nd uh, testimony to the Joint, uh, Joint Economic Committee. After our June FOMC meeting, you know, we got very, very uh, uh, meaningful increases in yields. Uh, within a couple of weeks, the 10-year had moved to 2.6, so about a one percentage point increase, and the real rate uh, had actually gone up even by a little bit more, more on the order of about 1.2 or, or 1.3. Um, now, in the, in the absence of a sort of significant shift in the underlying policy fundamentals, a number of people have talked about market dynamics, unwinding of carry trades, and convexity, hedging, and et cetera, it's a large outflows from ETFs and all of that. And I think these factors have been important. I mean, these strike me as plausible stories. I, I wish I had a better ability to evaluate them sort of precisely and quantitatively, but I, I you know, as, as, as a matter of market chatter, I, 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 do, take them, uh, I do take them absolutely seriously. Um, but maybe let me just reframe it a little bit. Rather than just trying to understand the market dynamics that were in play in, in, in May and June, it's also useful to ask a question about starting levels. That is to say, what explains why the 10-year was at 1.6? What explains why the tips were at minus 0.7 uh, um, uh, at the beginning of May? So clearly, our policies were sort of you know, present. I think there's circumstantial evidence that our policies played um, some role. But I'd like to draw a key distinction between two ways in which our policies uh, might have mattered. So one view is a kind of direct hydraulic view. That is to say, literally the central bank made the 10-year rate be 1.6 through some combination of forward guidance to get the expected path low, and then bearing down on the term premium literally via our purchases of, uh, of security. So let's call that the direct Fed control view. That's some notion where we're really able to, 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 to first order control the the, the, the tenure rate. Now, an alternative view is that our policies were indeed responsible um, in some sense, but through a more indirect channel. Um, so in this view, you know, the, the rates were low and term premium were low, not just because we were buying, um, but because something about our policies induced an outward shift in the demand curve of other investors, which led them to essentially do more buying uh, on our behalf both because we gave them an incentive to reach for yield by keeping the short rate very low, and at the same time provided, at least in the minds of some investors, a set of implicit assurances that tamped down volatility, and I think low volatility was an important part of, of what was going on, and made it feel, at least feel, safer to lever aggressively in pursuit of that, that extra yield. So in the spirit of my earlier comments, that's a sort of Fed recruitment view of how, how rates, got, uh, how rates got, uh, got so low. Um, and again, without a, a sharp test, I, I would say I take the events of the last few months to be evidence uh, somewhat in favor of the recruitment uh, view of the world, that we had help, that we had help. Now, again, I, I don't mean in any way to suggest that this is a bad thing. Uh, when you've got a big job to do, it helps to, to, bring, on, uh, to bring on help. And, uh, and in fact, the whole point of my talking about monetary policy in normal times was to suggest that at some level, this is how monetary policy always works. Monetary policy always works not only through its direct effect on the, short, the path of the short rate, but by involving other investors, by changing their induced demand for, for security. So I don't think there's anything really qualitatively different. And, I mean, obviously, the tools are a little bit different. But the basic idea that this is how monetary policy works, I think, applies here. Now, of course, the magnitudes are more impressive. 
In other words, maybe monetary policy is always kind of moving term premium around, but here the, the, the magnitude of the policy um, uh, had a bigger, had a bigger uh, effect. But it's, it's, it's important to kind of bear in mind, it's in some sense a turboed up version of how, uh, of how garden variety uh, monetary policy works. Now, at the same time, um, understanding this channel, or at least thinking about this channel, does highlight the, uh, the uncertainties that, that, that accompany uh, taking such a, an approach. That is to say, if the Fed's control of long rates is not literally just a, a you know, and, and Ragu raised this thing, you know, how is it that small changes in our stock of duration have big effects? Well, if, if it's all going through our duration, you know, we have a certain control over long-term rates. If it's going through the duration taken, bought, or sold by investors who are responding to us, then our grip on the steering wheel is going to be less tight than it would be if, if it was us doing all the buying ourselves. And if we're going to push these recruits very hard, as, as we arguably have over the last several months, um, I think it's more likely that you're, you're going to be vulnerable to a change in their behavior at, uh, at some point in, uh, in time. So I think it, it, it's, it's got to be the case that if it's a goal of policy to push term premiums far down into negative territory, and I, I take this as a legitimate goal of policy. I mean, it's in some sense, it's us pursuing our mandate. So I think it's an absolutely legitimate goal of policy, but I think we have to be prepared to understand that there's going to be some potential for elevated conditional volatility. I think that just, that just may, 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 go with, um, may go with the territory. So let me turn to, 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 to the topic that, 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 that Vitor um, mentioned, which is the interplay of, uh, of monetary policy and financial stability. I think this kind of trade-off, so here, not talking about credit bubbles or housing bubbles or anything, this is at some level a much more mundane thing about just conditional vol of, of certain kinds of rates and spreads. But I think this part of a, you know, and it may be a misnomer to even put this under the heading of financial stability, because none of this is, is anything that need threaten a financial, we're not talking about financial institutions uh, tipping over, we're not talking about uh, threats to the market's infrastructure. But nevertheless, whatever you want to call it, I think the understanding that there is this trade-off between sort of um, achieving sort of a, a, a large degree of accommodation and something about conditional volatility of rates, um, I think is important to, uh, to, to bear in mind. So, you know, the scenario I have in mind here, again, is not, a, is not a Lehman scenario by any stretch of the imagination. It's just the idea that you know, one risk, one risk scenario is we may get a, and we, we've gotten a little bit to some extent, but we may get a sharp increase in market rate, uh, market wide rates and spreads at an inopportune time in, in a way that just makes it harder for us to achieve, uh, to achieve our, our, our objectives. Um, so now having, having said all of this, I actually think we're in a reasonably, um, if I had to, to judge, I think we're in a reasonably good place with respect to the pricing of interest rate risk, which, which I've been focusing on. Um, you know, the movement that we've seen in, in Treasury rates uh, over the last few months has, has led to somewhat tighter financial conditions. I think it's been mitigated to some, to some degree by the fact that the stock market has still been reasonably buoyant and so forth. Um, but you know, for the mortgage market in particular, I think it's, it's fair to say that the higher rates are likely to be something of a, of a drag, and it remains to be seen um, how much of a drag. Um, so I think that's, 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 a, that's a, a downside. But at the same time, it has brought the term premium um, closer into line with historical norms, and arguably, therefore, has, has reduced the risk of a further upward um, uh, spike, which you know would have potentially come at some future date and might have been uh, more damaging had had the thing been held uh, held under for long. So my my take is to, is to be somewhat concerned about the tightness that's that's um, you know that that accompanies this for the for the, for the mortgage market. But to on net think that the adjustment has probably been um, to be has been a healthy one. So let me just conclude. Um, by, by, uh, by sort of not ducking the obvious and, and saying a few words about our FOMC meeting of, uh, of last week. So I, I voted along with the, the majority of the committee to continue our asset purchase program at its current uh, rate of $85 billion a month. Um, it was a close call for me. Uh, I did so, I think, because importantly, I, I thought it was very important to, to make clear that I support our efforts to provide uh, ongoing monetary accommodation to, uh, to support the recovery. Um, using both asset purchases as well as, uh, as well as our forward guidance. Now the question comes, you know, uh, how should the pace of purchases evolve, evolve going forward? Uh, the chairman laid out a framework at the June press conference 
um, for, for, for an eventual wind down of, of, of purchases. Within that framework, I would have been comfortable with beginning to taper uh, purchases at this September meeting. But whether we start in uh, September or a bit later is not itself the key issue. Because uh, if you think about it, the difference between, excuse me, the difference between moving from 85 to 75 now or a few months from now, Raigu made this point, the direct effect of those extra dollars of purchases um, has to be pretty modest, whether you call it a flow or you call it a stock. Um, and so what I think is sort of much more important and what we really have to focus, uh, focus on is doing everything we can to ensure that this difficult transition is implemented in a way that's as transparent and predictable as possible. And here I think it's safe to say that we, have, uh, we may have the potential for a little room for, for improvement. Um, so, uh, so, you know, what can you do to, to, to sort of achieve this, uh, this, this desire, transparency, and predictability? I don't think it requires, I don't think it requires us backing off from the, the principle of data dependence. I don't think it requires that the wind down happen in a way that is uh, independent of incoming data. But I do think that at, at this stage in the asset purchase program, um, and this is just my own view, I want, I want to be clear, I think there would be a great deal of merit in trying to find a way to make the link to data as observable and mechanical as possible. Um, so for this reason, again, my own personal preference would be to make future step downs a deterministic function of some kind of labor market indicator, be it the unemployment rate or uh, cumulative payroll job growth, something like that. So as a very concrete example, you could imagine a thing where we, we go out and say, for each um, 10 basis point, for each further one-tenth uh, reduction in the unemployment rate, we will reduce our purchases by X number of billion, uh, billion dollars. And obviously you have to refine it a little bit, but that would be the broad uh, proposal. Now, Obviously, I understand, and if I hadn't understood, it has been beaten into my head, that the unemployment rate is not a perfect summary statistic for the labor market or for the economy uh, more broadly, and I'm not trying to propose anything about a rules-based monetary policy more generally. Um, I think in this particular case, where there's this great deal of uncertainty about the asset pro purchase program, a rule like this, I, I believe, would help to reduce um, uncertainty about a reaction function, reduce the market volatility uh, that goes, on, uh, goes along with that. And moreover, it's crucial here we've got a second tool. We've got a second fundamental tool, which is our control of the path of the short rate. So, you know, there's a bunch of contingencies, you know, reduced labor force participation, weak inflation, that would not, you would not be able to accommodate with respect to asset purchases if you, if you did what I was proposing to do. But of course, those contingencies could be taken up in how we steer the path of the rate. So in other words, if you get to whatever you know, contracted level of unemployment you get to and the asset purchase program has wound down, but it has, you've gotten there on the back of disappointing output growth or weak labor force participation or lower than expected inflation, those would all be good reasons to keep the short rate lower for longer. So you haven't given up the ability to use discretion. In my example, you've just confined that discretion to one of the two tools and hopefully made communication about that tool um, a little bit easier. I mean, to respond to, to, to a question that Raghu raised, why do movements from 85 to 75 have such big impact on markets? Presumably it's not because that's a big dollar amount, but it has become, in a sort of strange history-dependent way, a piece of vocabulary. 85 just means something very, very different than 85 minus epsilon. And it means something different that is interpreted broadly as information about our reaction function and what we will do with the path of the short rate. So I guess what I'm proposing at some level is let's put the one aside and use a vocabulary directly about the path of the short rate to talk about the path of the, of, of, of the, of the short rate. So um, that's basically it. Uh, thanks very much, and I, I look forward to the conversation. Okay, thank you very much for three very stimulating um, presentations. We are running a bit la late. Uh, we have exactly two minutes for discussion, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I will uh, break the rules uh, so, uh, and allow a few more uh, questions, but we can definitely not go um, beyond, uh, say, five o'clock or so. So um, 
sorry, six o'clock. Uh, <laughs> so let's have uh, some questions from the audience. Okay. I've already got the mic from ah. your colleague. Ah, you have I'm it. I'm sorry. Yes, no, no, uh, no, it's very good. Uh, Hermann Remsberger. Uh, I would uh, like to ask um, Vitor Constancio to give us some forward guidance uh, on macro potential policy. Uh, the, the first short question I have is what is your favorite instrument for macro potential policy? And the second, what about the interplay between macro potential policy and monetary policy? Is it uh, possible to assume that the ECB uh, keeps on with uh, easing or uh, loose monetary policy and at the same time uh, we will observe uh, tightening in macro potential policy, a rather strange kind of a, a policy mix? And uh, finally, uh, what's really new about a forward guidance if forward guidance is data dependent and conditional. Maybe that's also a question to Jeremy Stein. Thank you. Well, thank you for your questions. Um, regarding uh, macro prudential instruments, of course, it all depends on the uh, um, facts that justify the use of macro prudential tools. There are many, uh, so there is not, it's not possible to define an overall preference um, in uh, what regards the different uh, possible instruments. Uh, but trying to uh, say connect with the concern that uh, exists in uh, this country uh, in, in some spheres, uh, there is this uh, uh, notion that uh, housing prices are increasing. Well, it's very difficult to portray it as a bubble because the figures are still quite small. Uh, but assuming that there is, this is a concern, it's something that would not justify the use of the blunt, blind general instrument of interest rates to deal with it, but it could be dealt with by changing uh, loan-to-value ratios, for instance. Uh, and uh, even uh, in the extreme, to be more intrusive in what regards credit policy of the banks that uh, would be financing such a development. And that would be a very focused way of dealing with something that, of course, is also connected with the low uh, interest rate uh, environment, uh, but would not imply that the monetary policy would have to change for everything. And there is no contradiction between the two things because precisely uh, what happens is that there was before the crisis and may exist now as a result of a long period of low interest rates a disconnect between what is happening in the market of goods and services and what is happening in the market for assets, including housing and financial uh, assets. And this disconnect, with, which existed before, may exist, but monetary policy is more appropriate to focus on the equilibrium in market of goods and services by trying to ensure that we have non-inflationary growth uh, in that market. And then if we have instruments that can deal with containing the effects on asset uh, markets, that's the way to go. And one can be restrictive and the other can stay loose because that's the economic conditions that uh, uh, we face uh, right now. Of course, forward guidance, as it must be uh, conditional, otherwise it's something that doesn't seem, uh, I would say, perhaps uh, appropriate just to say, well, we will keep rates until 2017. That would be rash to make such a statement. No one can know what developments will come. So forward guidance is necessarily conditional. And that, of course, diminishes the degree of the commitment that is involved. That's unavoidable. But in any case, there is a commitment and a, a statement 
that the way we see the situation, where we assess the risks for inflation, say, in the next two years, is such that we don't anticipate, if the uh, world continues uh, to adjust, to, to correspond to our vision, if that is the case, then we don't see a reason to change rates. So it provides some information. Um, although not uh, watertight information, that's for sure, but it provides some information, and as I said, it really had some effect on the uh, short part of the forward curve of euro rates, uh, and it was a way of uh, reducing the impact of a contagion coming from the US, uh, which was not totally justified from an economic point of view, because in the US the increase in rates is accompanying uh, a recovery which is stronger than in Europe, so it's normal if the recovery is confirmed that interest rates uh, will gradually increase, but in Europe the recovery is much weaker and still very fragile. So what we did uh, uh, was in fact something that had an effect as we intended. Jeremy, would you like? Uh, yeah, let me. I'll just, I'll just say another word about forward guidance. Um, uh, say another word about forward guidance. Uh, first of all, as, as Vitor said, there's sort of the issue of commitment. I actually think that I think there's a little bit of um, unclarity, and I don't think commitment is a zero one. But I actually think that there's, in some sense, a little bit more of commitment-like stuff if you do it on a data-linked uh, basis rather than a calendar basis. In other words, as you suggest, if one were to just say, we're going to keep this at zero till 2017, it's just implausible at some level. So you're not, whereas if you, if you made a more reasonable statement and you link it to unemployment, it becomes a more plausible promise to keep. So I don't think you're bound by it in any legal sense, but I think you've probably put a little bit more of your capital on the line, so in some sense it has a little bit more, more force. And another point, uh, sort of separate from commitment, uh, the question was asked is how is this any different than monetary policy that is usually data dependent, in the sense that monetary policy usually follows empirically something that could be approximated by a Taylor rule. Why is this any different? Well, I think in part because the information that we're communicating is saying under these circumstances we will follow a rule that looks different than what you might have predicted if you were simply extrapolating our behavior uh, based on a Taylor rule. So for example, in our most recent, um, uh, the Fed just released a summary of economic projection, projections where members of the FOMC have a projection, I forget the exact number, but it's sort of in the ballpark of the Fed funds rate being 2% at the end of 2016, at the same time that they have the economy pretty close to back to full employment and inflation pretty close back to 2%. So in other words, the Taylor rule would suggest that you'd be closer to a 4% funds rate than a 2% funds rate. And in part, this is, you know, what we're doing is, is laying this, this thought out there and then trying to explain why that might be a reasonable time consistent thing, given the headwinds that are still maybe bearing on, on the economy at that time. But I, it's, it's not something that I think people could have conjectured their way to just based on a past extrapolation of how the, how the central bank has behaved uh, relative to data in, in prior years. Okay, I think you have that. No. Oh, does it? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, now okay. it is, yes. Now, I have <coughs> two questions. One to, uh, uh, to Governor uh, Stein. I'm not sure whether I understood you correctly, but uh, uh, you gave the impression that by uh, setting short-term rates, uh, you can more or less directly influence long-term rates uh, uh, of bonds, of government bonds, presumably. Now, I have the uh, memory at least of decades of central banking that very often is just uh, um, an opposite connex. You said short-term rates are raised and then long-term uh, rates uh, came uh, uh, also right. went up, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. I have the experience that uh, at least in uh, Bundesbank times in the past that whenever the Bundesbank was very tough and raised rates, then the long-term rates came down. Why that? I think it's more plausible to us that if you give to the general public the impression that this central bank is a tough central bank and which really has firstly in mind inflation and, you know, very solid currency, 
but then long-term rates go down. And otherwise, you, get, uh, you could uh, indeed uh, even raise inflationary expectations for Drago, was, uh, um, uh, Mr. Rajan was uh, uh, referring to, that uh, by having an easy money policy, people lose their confidence in the currency, and that would have an impact on long-term rates. And then I have another <coughs> question, just because of the remarks uh, uh, of Mr. Constancio. Uh, I'm not sure whether we can tell the general public that there is a very, very big difference between the prices for uh, commodities and services uh, represented by inflation rates and by uh, the uh, raise of prices in certain asset classes. You mentioned, for example, housing. I mean, if housing gets more and more expensive, this has a direct effect on, on the people. And, of course, if you would say, well, we can differentiate our policy, we don't care about asset price bubbles and we only care about the inflation index for commodities and prices, I mean, this differentiation wouldn't be convincing to me, to be honest. So thanks, that was a very good question. And maybe I should be a little more careful in my choice of words um, in the sense of influence long-term rates, control long-term, you know. Let me, let me just make the usual statistical observation that when you do one of these studies, you can find a variable that comes in statistically significant, has a high T statistic, and has an R squared that's still pretty close to zero. So that is to say, it's an influence, just like if I said, you know, if you ate more carrots, uh, you might live a little bit longer, and it might have a statistically significant influence. It doesn't explain the lion's share of the variation. So, of course, it's completely consistent with there being lots of other episodes and lots of other lots of other factors at work and nothing I would say would ever, I would ever want to be you know, heard to suggest that you can really kind of control. In fact, that was in some sense my main point, that you may be able to influence it, but you know, it's far beyond your control what the, what the term premium is going to do. And we know from, you know, in some sense, a central theme of research in asset pricing is most of the variation in asset prices, be they stocks, long-term bonds, credit, is due to changes in discount rates as opposed to changes in fundamentals, with changes in discount rates being a fancy word for stuff we don't know anything about. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to say there's a little effect. There's a, there's a sort of, you know, a, 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 of the stuff that we can explain, some of it comes from monetary policy, but there's a lot of variation that we don't, that we don't understand. And that, in some sense, I'm trying to be clear that that's a, that's a limitation. Yes, uh, thank you. Of course, uh, Okay. Now I was uh, responding. Uh, of course, the price of housing is important, and for any uh, central bank, uh, it, it's uh, it's considered. But it's also true that uh, uh, houses uh, are an asset, are a stock, and so when you build an index of uh, prices, uh, the way housing is included there. Is, uh, has to be very special because it, and it cannot be just the price of new houses because there is a stock and you must have some uh, uh, way of calculating the price of the services that uh, are being provided by that asset. And that's not easy and that's why initially in Europe in the uh, uh, HICP housing was not included. So inflation is measured without, uh, without considering that. And uh, a working group has been working, has worked for uh, quite a number of years to try to devise the best way to include uh, the housing in the price uh, index. So it's not an easy problem. And of course, uh, monetary policy in general could not be decided just because of what is going on in the price of that asset. Uh, and that's a difficulty and a limitation. Yes, of course, I recognize and we <laughs> all recognize that the price of uh, new houses is important for the population in general and so on. There is no, no question about that. But there is that difficulty. The second thing is, of course, as you well know, that uh, we have to define our, decide our policy for the whole euro area 
and that phenomenon is not happening uh, uh, really right now in many places in the economic situation of most of the countries of the uh, euro area. Uh, and that's another consideration, which means that the, when there are very limited, focused uh, phenomenon of asset prices developing in a different way to the general economic situation, then that's when macroprudential tools are, have to be used and should be used instead of the more general and blunt monetary policy. And that's what I tried to, to say. Thank you. Um, Matthias Bergner from Deutsche Bank. Um, Professor Rajan shared with us some interesting thoughts uh, early on about the unintended consequences of this ultra-low interest rate environment on, on savings behavior. And I would be very curious also from Governor Stein to, to understand, you mentioned the transmission mechanism and whether you feel that it would still hold true in even a negative uh, policy environment, negative rate policy environment. Um. Let me just first uh, agree with the, the, the broad spirit of, of, of Raghu's comments, which I took to, to be something like, you know, we're deep in a world of second best. You know, that there's all kinds, you know, we have all kinds of sort of microeconomic and structural issues that are not being dealt with in the appropriate way. Monetary policy is being left to sort of carry more of the weight than, than you would ideally like relative to fiscal policy. So I agree with all, and, and so necessarily, even if it's doing good and moving things in the right direction, there are going to be some collateral costs, be they financial stability, be they distributional. So I, I think that broad observation is right. I mean, now there's a stronger, a, str a stronger form of this critique, which is it's not even moving things in the right direction. Um, that's ultimately an empirical question. I mean, I understand the effect, the sort of effect that some people will consume less because they're, uh, you know, they're trying to uh, save more. Uh, it's ultimately empirical question. I mean, my prior is that it would be sort of a strong and empirically surprising thing for that effect to overwhelm the first order effect. Um, because, of, of course, you know, if you literally focus on somebody who is just doing nothing more than being a saver, and all they're doing is putting their money in a bank with a CD with a low rate, you're focusing on a very particular part of the demographic distribution. In other words, many people are both savers and borrowers, and for those guys, you know, being able to borrow at low mortgage rates helps, or they have a somewhat more diversified portfolio, and low interest rate policies have been quite helpful for the housing market, for house values, and all of that. So my instinct, having done the work, is that if you aggregate, there's, you know, there's an effect pushing from one part of the demographic, but if you aggregate, and you sort of aggregate all the wealth effects, that effect would have to be very strong to overwhelm the stuff that's pushing in the other uh, the other direction. So that's not to push too much against the generalized second best nature, but the sign going the wrong way, I guess I, I'm at this point not, uh, not persuaded by. Thank, thank you very much, Piat Singh from UBS. Um, I, I found quite intriguing what uh, Jeremy Stein, what you said on, uh, on transparency and, uh, and predictability, and it kind of sounded like um, uh, maximum transparency and predictability would be, would be desirable. Um, and um, uh, you mentioned the last FOMC meeting, and of course in the market we were um, surprised and many people, you know, thought they were almost like misled or whatever. Um, so so I, I'm wondering, and maybe for the two other uh, central bank or ex-central bankers as well. And because in market, many people said, well, they, maybe they wanted to surprise us. Maybe there is a value from, uh, on, on central banks to surprise from time to time. Or, or would you just say, well, what we need to do is to work towards maximum transparency and predictability and have some kind of framework uh, for the guidance or whatever where we can, where we can achieve that. Or is that not realistic and you, you, you will have situations where you do create more volatility because um, there might be a negative side to that as well. So let me just respond. So it's, it's a very strong norm that we're supposed to each be speaking for ourselves and not representing the views of others on the committee. But I'm going to break that just a little bit to say that I, one thing I, I'm sure is that nobody was doing something to intentionally surprise the market. I mean, I think, you know, 
There may be disagreement about what the right policy is from a fundamental perspective and how, how mixed the outlook is and so forth, but the policy is clearly designed first and foremost to be, you know, to be stabilizing uh, for the market. Now, as insofar as the communication challenge, I think the reason it's really sort of challenging now is because there are two things which pull a little bit differently. One is, again, as I said, the direct effect of asset purchases. So if you're thinking in a kind of direct, I want to do more for the economy and this is something that helps, that, that pushes you in one direction. There's the other thing, which is as the program winds down and as the remaining amount of asset purchases becomes smaller and smaller, the effects run less and less through this direct hydraulic bearing down on the term premium and more and more through signaling and more and more through, well, if we've done, I mean, we're just in this funny equilibrium where we have done 85 every month for 12 months or every meeting for the last 12 months. So 85 has taken on this very, very special meaning. And I think figuring out how to sort of deal with that challenge, I think, is, is, is what's making things difficult. So I think different people came out different places. Nobody, I, I can assure you, know, was thinking, let's do this because it doesn't communicate well. Um, you know, I think it was, it was exactly the opposite, which I think in, 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 in all times is, you know, the most important thing is to get the policy right. And, you know, as a second order thing, let's try to, let's try to not surprise, uh, let's not try to surprise. Well, if I may add something very briefly, uh, I agree with what uh, Jeremy just said, because central banks don't like, uh, as a rule, to surprise the markets. It's all in the, uh, in the framework of having a policy that, uh, in a way, smooths uh, the development of interest rates. We uh, don't uh, like too much uh, cliff effects. So that's part of it, that uh, uh, it's not a goal of uh, policies to, to surprise the markets. It happens. Uh, I was trying to recollect since uh, uh, the beginning of the, uh, of the euro uh, if we had really once surprised the markets. And I remember once uh, Otmar was still uh, a member of the board at that time. Uh, I think it was in uh, uh, May 2002, but I am not totally sure, because markets were creating a, a, a version of what was going to happen um, in the next uh, uh, meeting uh, of the Governing Council that was wrong as a vision. Uh, and so we had to communicate abruptly that that was not true and that uh, really had an effect uh, in the markets uh, that was not very much liked by the markets. But I would say that from time to time, central banks also have to demonstrate that they are independent also from the markets, that they don't have to follow the markets all the time. <laughs> so we, we owe to Bob Merton the question after the last. Uh, but that's going to be the last. <laughs> so. Oh, well, I always hate to take, <laughs> uh, take the last question. But uh, you, uh, Raghu mentioned in some of the unintended consequences and issues, older people saving, and that's why the consumption didn't go through. But one place where you can actually measure the numbers quite significantly, both here in Europe and in the U.S., is to do an honest assessment of the value of the pension liabilities as a consequence of long-term interest rates, assuming that you control them enough and you're affecting them. If not, then why bother? So I'm assuming you can. And those numbers, at least the ones I've looked at, are enormous. So, I mean, if you saw that you added a trillion dollars just to make up a number to a liabilities of pensions as a result of what you not recently, but had you over cumulatively, do you take account of that and say, you know, that's, somebody has to pay for that. Do you, you see what I mean? This is an interplay of the unintended consequence, because I assume that's not what you want to do, is to put the pension industry underwater, but in reality, that's what happens. Okay. Uh, is there any... Would, I'll, I'll quickly try to respond. I mean, I think there's two, two ways you, we, we do follow this, this sort of thing. I mean, one, one reason to follow it with pensions, with life insurance companies, are for financial stability reasons. I think we just want to understand if, if, the, if things are getting riskier as a result, either because of the direct effect of their balance sheets or induced behavior. So we certainly pay attention to it. 
Um, beyond that, there's sort of these redistributive effects that you talk about, um, which we're certainly aware of, and it's a little harder to know how to factor that into the policy calculation because, of course, these redistributive effects are on top of a bunch of other redistributive effects. You know, are the people who are being hurt, you know, some people are gaining, some people are losing. Are the people who are losing also stockholders, homeowners, and so forth? So it's a little harder to know normatively what I would do with that information in isolation without being able to have a kind of clearer picture of the overall kind of distributional picture. But I mean, we certainly pay attention to this from a financial stability uh, perspective. Okay, so let's bring the um, event to a close. I, I would like to uh, thank and congratulate Raghura Jan once uh, again for a prize uh, well deserved. I would like to thank the speakers and contributors. Uh, I should say that the, the dream team uh, lived up to its uh, to expectations. Uh, I would like to finally thank all of you for coming here and contributing to the success of this event. And uh, we want to see you back in two years. Okay. So thank you.